So tonight's science pub talk is entitled Cerro Gordo from Community to Conservation. In 2017, the McKenzie River Trust, or MRT, so they're often called, um, and Cerro Gordo Land Conservancy, oh, careful for those cords too, sorry, they're taped, but just be careful. Um, and Cerro Gordo Land Conservancy secured a conservation easement through the Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Program, preserving 531 acres of su the Southern Willamette Valley's most precious and pristine meadows, oak woodland, riparian areas, and conifer forests. Mackenzie River Trust Land Protection Manager Robin Meacher in this talk will highlight Cerro Gordo's special features of habitat and plant community, including its vital role as an anchor for continuing conservation of the Rau River drainage. Eric Allen will add detail of Cerro Gordo's path of community and conservation from its when 1974 purchase as a site for environmentally sound intentional community to its current conservation success with, so, with over 1,000 acres forever protected from development. And Eric was a founding board member of Cerro Gordo Land Conservancy and he's a second generation Cerro Gordo res resident. And with that, we'd like to welcome the first speaker tonight, uh, Robin Meacher. There she is. I was like, where is she? There you go. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm terrible at talking into microphones, so if I turn my head or if it just ends up on the ground, tell me and I will try and pick it back up and continue. Just, just like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as Maggie said, my name is Robin Meacher. I am the Land Protection Manager for the McKenzie River Trust. Um, I'm going to introduce Cerro Gordo the Place here before we get into Eric's talk, which will go a little bit more into um, the property's history and the community there. Okay, so first I'll introduce a little bit about the McKenzie River Trust. Um, as our nomenclature tends to somewhat confuse people when we get outside of the Mackenzie River drainage. Um, so we are a regional land trust. Uh, that is, we're an organization that purchases um, land outright or holds conservation easements on private land for the benefit of the public, protecting property with outstanding conservation values. Our service area includes the watersheds of the Long Tom River, the Upper Willamette, the Coast and Middle Forks of the Willamette River, the Umpqua River, the Sayuzla River, and coastal streams and lakes from Reedsport to Yahats. We were founded. <laughs> thanks. We were founded in 1989. Um, so next year we'll be celebrating our 30th birthday. And this map is somewhat out of date. Um, we have few other properties that um, should be listed on there that we've protected since this map was printed. Sorry, I'm going to go through my notes and the slides here. So our mission as an organization is to help people protect and care for the lands and rivers they cherish in Western Oregon. Um, our core strategies for doing this is by helping people protect their land through private Conserv lands conservation tools that I mentioned just before, um, stewarding and restoring land in partnership with private landowners and on the properties that we own ourselves outright, and connecting people to the land through volunteer opportunities, tours, and events. I do have a sign-up sheet that might make its way around um, if you'd like to connect with us in the future. If not, there'll be a website on the next or on the end of the presentation. Sorry. So since our founding, um, we've protected over 5,000 acres of land in our service area. And then in tw 2017, after nearly seven years of working together, the McKenzie River Trust purchased a conservation easement over or from the Cerro Gordo Land Conservancy, uh, permanently protecting approximately 531 acres of oak, prairie, and upland forest habitat. So now to actually talk about Cerro Gordo. Cerro Gordo, the place, is 
mostly this. Um, I think this might have cut off actually a little bit, but <laughs> I tried my best to try and get the panoramic shot up there for folks to take a look at. So it's that towering butte above Dorena Lake and the surrounding prairie, oak savanna, woodlands, and conifer upland forest. Um, as many of you are probably aware, it is a prominent feature on the landscape and it provides visually stunning views when both looking at it and then as you'll see in further in my presentation and I'm sure from Eric's as well, um, the views from it are equally as stunning. So a brief bit about just the context of where Cerro Gordo fits in our landscape. Um, obviously this large piece of land highlighted here above Dorena Lake is Cerro Gordo. Um, I'll get a little bit more into, there's two conservation easements on the property. I'll expand on that a little bit later. Um, but mostly it's nestled in fed, amongst federal timber land owned by the Bureau of Land Management and then some additional private lands. Though you can't really see it, actually I tried to draw it in, you can't see it on this map, but there are two additional prairie properties in the Rao River drainage that are protected um, by two different federal agencies. The Army Corps of Engineers has one right down there at the base of Cerro Gordo that they call Rao River Point Restoration Area. And then the Bureau of Land Management has Dorena Prairie Area of Critical Environmental Concern, which is just a little bit um, downstream on the Rao River as well. So the protection of Cerro Gordo added another piece to the string of pearls that helps provide connectivity for both the plant populations and the wildlife that depend on these prairie and oak habitats. Um, and then the diligent management of these habitats at Cerro Gordo to this point and then into the future will help these special places persist on our landscape. Cerro Gordo's diversity of plant communities um, and the quality of the oak and prairie habitat that make the area an incredibly important part of the effort to protect these dwindling plant communities. I apologize, you can't read any of that. Um, <laughs> but it does highlight the different types of habitat that are at Cerro Gordo. There is um, prairie, oak woodland, upland mixed conifer, and then some riparian area. And one thing I want to point out, so the prairie habitat on Cerro Gordo is actually incredibly diverse just in the types of prairie that exist there as well. Um, there's not just, hold on, let me find it. The prairie is the light green. Yes, the prairie is the light green, which also might not be that easy to see. Um, so it has, Cerro Gordo has upland prairie, wet prairie, savanna, which as I mentioned earlier is prairie with a little bit of trees in it. Um, and what's really significant about this is because of the size of the protected area and the habitats on Cerro Gordo is that every one of these prairies exists in a large enough um, amount of land to really provide the type of area that prairie dependent species need in order to thrive. So when Mackenzie River Trust is, was thinking of working with Cerro Gordo, and Cerro Gordo came to us, really, um, it was these habitats that really stood out as the reason why this area really warranted protection. And not just the habitats that were there, but the incredible preservation of those habitats by the community and the people that lived there and visited there and spent their time there. So for the rest of my presentation, I'm going to focus just on those oak and prairie habitats and a little bit about the plants and wildlife that are dependent on them and also are found at Cerro Gordo. Before I get into that, though, I want to go a little bit more into just the overall context of oak and prairie within the Willamette Valley, really explain why it is that these habitats are so necessary to protect and to manage in a way that allows their persistence on our landscape. Again, I apologize, you, actually this map might be a little bit better because it is so drastic, the difference between the historic pre-European settlement valley conditions in oak and prairie and what we have less. This was actually 2004, so it's probably less than that at this point. Um, 
But collectively, the Oregon white oak habitat and prairie plant communities in the Willamette Valley has declined over 40% from their pre-settlement extent. And this includes oak woodland. So I know that your minds probably, well, may be confused by the trivia questions that had percentages and numbers thrown out like crazy. And that really is just part of when trying to quantify how much of this habitat has been lost. There's lots of gradation between what is oak savanna, what is prairie, what is oak woodland. So it's really hard to find that exact balance. So I apologize for tricking you all earlier with the trivia. But that's an important thing to think about. Um, so the Willamette Valley historically had one of the most expansive areas of oak and prairie habitats in Oregon. It has also undergone the greatest extent of loss to those habitats of any region in Oregon. We need subdivisions! <laughs> Getting me to my next point. So when you look at the valley, all those beautiful places that you want to live in and you want to farm are also the best and most suitable areas for oak and prairie habitat. So with conversion to urban and suburban development, and along with the increasing desire for rural residential homes, the habitats continue to be fragmented and reduced. This encroachment of development also decreases the ability to manage those sites that currently do persist. Oak and Prairie is highly dependent on fire and other disturbance tools, such as um, conifer removal to keep encroachment out, that sometimes can be a little messy when you're surrounded by other residential pieces. That isn't to say, though, that oak habitats are not, can't coexist with humans um, and even thrive together. In reality, many of the activities such as agriculture, timber management, and even building our homes can be done in a manner compatible with maintaining existing sites. Um, and with the majority of this habitat existing on private lands currently, that's a really important thing to recognize and to work with groups like the Coast Fork Watershed Council who are so effective at partnering with private landowners to really work and make that restoration happen. <coughs> so now to um, some of the plants that are on, well, the prairie plants that are at Cerro Gordo. Overall, there are about 375 species of vascular plants that are strongly associated with prairie and oak plant communities in general. Cerro Gordo itself boasts a high diversity of native plant species with over 205 native species being documented on the property in a plant survey in 2014, though not all of those were prairie and oak associated. Of these plants, there are three rare species that really stand out that have been documented so far. And with such a large land area, there may be more species. We just haven't found them yet. I'm sure they're working really hard to find those. Um, the first one is this one right here, which is Shaggy Orchelia. For those of you who saw the uh, trivia question, it is not a made up plant name. It really exists. Um, so Shaggy Orchelia is a federal species of concern and a candidate for state listing in the State Endangered Species Act. It grows in prairies and oak savanna habitat. In the Willamette Valley, it is typically associated with elevated portions of wet prairies, dry uplands, and along the drip line of oaks and Douglas fir. It is in the rose family and it reproduces by seed. The plant forms rosettes of basil leaves and eventually produces one or more flowering stems, as you can see in this photo right here. Second plant I want to feature is Timwort. Timwort is threatened with extirpation or ex presumed to be extirpated from the state of Oregon. However, here it is on Cerro Gordo. It also exists, also exists at other sites within the valley. But um, Timor is a small annual of wet or moist prairies with these delightful little yellow flowers, but they only open on sunny days. So that can make these plants really hard to spot when you're doing plant surveys. So if your conditions aren't perfect, you might have to go back out and do another survey if you expect this plant might be on the property. They favor disturbance, especially fire. So these are one of those plant species that really can benefit from having fire on the landscape. The last pl plant I want to focus on, though it is not a prairie plant species, is tall bugbane. Tall bugbane is essentially associated 
with mature conifer forest habitats and often occurs in patches or populations of small numbers of plants, can often benefit from a somewhat more open canopy. So if you want to create conditions that might work for this, but you have a second growth, kind of even stocked stand of trees, you could create that opening through thinning um, or other type of disturbance activities. You can, well, can't really tell here, but its leaves are generally pretty large. They're divided into three sections, somewhat resembling maple. Um, its flowers have two to three foot stems topped with long, thin head of white to pale pink flowers. Though I didn't have a picture of it flowering on Cerro Gordo, picture a bottle brush sticking out from there, and that's basically what the flowering blood vein looks like when it is in flower. And it is a member of the buttercup family. So those are three species of plants that are more on the rare side. Um, there's many other notable plant species at Cerro Gordo, too many for me to really cover, so I just pulled out some of my favorite. Uh, this right here is the hairy clover. And then death camas is in, I think, every meadow on Cerro Gordo, um, as well as common ca camas. And then you have scenes like this. This is a monkey flower, larkspur, and sea blush plant community, um, which is one of my favorite photos, just shows really the diversity of the plant communities at Cerro Gordo. And then moving into some of the wildlife. So really quick, um, as I come to the end of my time, this is the Western Meadowlark. Um, I'm gonna highlight just two wildlife, um, one bird, one mammal, um, that are both strategy species under the Oregon Conservation Strategy. So these are species that have been highlighted as um, special for conservation due to habitat loss. And the Western Meadowlark, which many of you are probably familiar with, um, they seek wide open spaces. Grasslands are ideal. They are known to exist at Cerro Gordo. Um, they typically use grasslands and open spaces for spring and summer breeding and winter foraging. They prefer medium height grasses, less so than tall. So this is another, um, just another species. It doesn't have to be a plant species that can actually benefit from fire and other activity in some of these prairie areas to keep that thatch from growing over and um, creating less than suitable conditions. When flushed, the western meadowlarks fly low, gliding and flapping with short, stiff, quail-like wing beats. In spring and summer, the males sing out from perches and some of you might be familiar with the song. If you feel like doing it, go ahead. I cannot. And finally, the western gray squirrel. The western gray squirrel um, is also an Oregon conservation strategy species of, <laughs> got some squirrel fans. <laughs> um, the habitat for the western gray squirrel includes oak woodlands, savannas, and mixed oak pine fir woodlands. The western gray squirrel has been less successful than the eastern gray squirrel at adapting to new habitats and is therefore more susceptible to habitat loss. They prefer to live in oak woodlands. Many of you probably associate them with acorns, um, but they also prefer to have oak wood, to nest in oak woodlands that have some bit of conifer. They like to use kind of the cavities that you find in conifers for building their nests. And then they prefer to build their nests in areas where they can have continuous tree canopy so they can stay above the ground as they're moving and not have to go down and then back up. And then really quick before we end, this is an important part that um, I showed earlier, but I didn't get to. But um, the conservation easement with Mackenzie River Trust is not the only way that the folks at Cerro Gordo have protected their property. There's also um, a 457, right? 447 acre conservation easement with the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Services, which protects um, a significant amount of conifer forest that is managed for habitat and to promote wildlife habitat that is rare in the surrounding landscape, which brings the total protected area at Cerro Gordo to nearly 1,000 acres. Um, so this right here, that big green block um, north of Darina is the NRCS conservation easement. So I'm gonna turn it over to Eric now. I hope that was a 
if not hurried, um, good enough introduction to the site before Eric talks a little bit more about the community. So thank you all. Well, thank you all for being here. It's really uh, wonderful to come out from the woods and step into the big city here. It's <laughs> the path from community to conservation in Cerro Gordo actually starts a long time before the purchase of the land in 1974 because originally it was Kalapuya territory way back when, and we have a map that goes back about as far as 1860 that shows a wigwam very close to where our houses are now. So it was Kalapuya territory until unfortunately they were rather decimated by diseases and eventually ceded their land in 1855 and basically were folded into Grand Ronde and Silets over time. So there's a Kalapuya history on the land at Cerro Gordo as well. And then after that, there were other settlers that came along. In the 1880s, the Doolittle family came from Michigan established quite a bit on Cerro Gordo. They had, they put in two orchards, they built a sawmill, they ran a one-room schoolhouse up there. They built a bunkhouse that had as many as 22 people in it at various times. It was uh, quite a little operation they had. They called it Paradise Hill, but as people in Paradise, California can tell you right now too, naming someplace Paradise does not help. So. It was not paradise for them, and it began to be very difficult. They lost four children at Cerro Gordo. The parents buried four children and both of their parents due to illness and other issues. And by 1922, they had left Cerro Gordo at that point. Um, we still have six of them on the landscape. There is Lucky Doolittle of Company C of the 8th Michigan Infantry. And uh, we thank him for his service. One of the children, obviously a bit of pioneer naming going on on the community up there. Nothing like Lewis Clark Doolittle. Where do you think they got that name from? But I was up there just last week and I started to realize that I wondered who wasn't buried there. If there are four children and the grandparents what happened to everybody else? And I started doing a little bit of digging and discovered that there were three other siblings that made it out of there, including one who was born fourth after the first three boys died. And she lived to be 101 years old and was actually living in Cottage Grove until 2011 and is now in the Sears Cemetery. So that put a different perspective on history for me because it all seems so distant and so long ago. And in truth, it's very connected to the local community still. But they did fade away. The parents actually, they stuck around for a long time too and they lived and had good, good long lives and are a part of the community. There are many of the Doolittle clan that still exist in this local region. So there's a lot of roots from the Doolittles to Cerro Gordo. By 1970, there was uh, quite an interest in uh, a different kind of intentional community going on with all the turbulence in the 60s and the early 70s. And by the early 1970s, Chris Canfield and others had become interested in finding a piece of property to build a new town. Initially, they wanted to build it in Northern California and started having meetings in California and looked for various properties and didn't find what they were looking for down in Northern California. But by 1974, they found the land at Cerro Gordo. And it had many of the things that they were looking for. Good southern sun exposure, access to water. It had the potential to connect to a rail system, which they wanted because they wanted to be a car-free community and attached to rail and many other things along those lines. So they were able to purchase the Cerro Gordo Ranch for alternative community, which when you think about real estate prices is a fairly remarkable achievement. It wouldn't be doable today probably to purchase 1,158 acres for what is now about the price of a good single family home. But 
they managed to do that and launched off on the ambitious dream that Chris and other people had. This photo is being passed around in other hard copy form. This, this we notice, if we look at the relief map, is backwards. This was uh, published backwards in a book called Resettling America about the intentional communities movement and included an entire chapter on Cerro Gordo. So here is Chris Canfield and a bunch of people in the barn in, mm, I don't know, 1970s sometime talking about the ambitious and beautiful dream that Cerro Gordo was. So that photo actually got uh, flipped on the magazine correctly for one of the early Cerro Gordo publications as well. Well, my mother, Shirley Freud, was one of the original owner builders here, and she is here over there tonight. And as, <laughs> as was Suzanne Hubner Sanis, was another one of the very original people here, and there are many other people there. And they started to build in 1978 or so. There is my mother uh, starting to work on the log house up there, the log house duplex that uh, she and a Quaker couple originally from Maine, Bob and Connie Brown, began to work on this house in 1978. And there are Bob and Connie and my mother with uh, the logs partially in place. So beginning the vision of the community dream and another photo of them in 1978 with my sister Carol outside of the house building that log structure. There were many articles in the Sentinel and the Register Guard and other places about all the beautiful dreams at Cerro Gordo and all of the challenges that begin to set in. It was uh, not an easy time from the beginning as community never is. But somewhere back there, there were these bells that were made to represent Cerro Gordo and its dream and the vision that it had. And on the back of this bell, it said, Cerro Gordo is 1,200 acres of forest and meadowland on the north shore of Dorena Lake in the foothills of the Oregon Cascades. Future residents are designing a car-free community with a broad-based economy, a symbiosis of village and natural environments, town meetings, and alternative energy production. We're creating a community process that fosters personal growth and a more fulfilling way of living. Our growing community invites your participation. Maybe we'll end up neighbors. Those bells were a little bit fragile beyond design. They broke in the wind when the clapper hit them, and that was kind of a community metaphor as well. It, uh, you know, there were immediate issues beginning to get building permits. There were misunderstandings with the wider community about what the community perhaps saw as 2,500 hippies wanting to make a commune, which is not exactly accurate, but uh, there were a lot of skepticism in the community, difficulties with building permits, challenges amongst the community in deciding what the vision would be, the realities of economics, and all sorts of things began to uh, not go as planned. Throughout it all, however, Chris Canfield always gave the instruction to Scott Ferguson, the forester on the land, starting in 1986 and others. Scott has often recounted to us that Chris always said, take care of the land, do what is right for the land. And that fundamental instruction has made it possible for us to have this land preserved today to have for the wider community. That has been a very, very vital thing that Chris and others have taken care of throughout all the ups and downs of Cerro Gordo. By the time I moved back home in 2010 for good, they were just on the verge of getting that first conservation easement that goes through the Healthy Forest Reserve Program of the Natural Resources Conservation Service, protecting 447 acres of land, ostensibly for spotted owl habitat, whether the owls arrive and survive is another question that's probably beyond our control in a lot of ways, but nonetheless, we were able to succeed in getting this conservation easement to protect that land and was just in time from Chris Canfield's perspective because he passed away of a massive heart attack the week that was completed. And 
the very final time I saw Chris was for a champagne celebration that we had. We had a movie night up at Cerro Gordo and it just happened and Chris came by with champagne to celebrate the conservation easement success. We all toasted to that success and then Friday night at dinner, he passed away. So regardless of whether or not we have owls on that particular bit of habitat, we have a lot of other creatures up there, that's for sure. It is definitely a place where there's a lot of wildlife from the bears and the cougar and the deer and the foxes and many other species. It's a pretty wild land up there and it is really precious to have that land around. So we thank Chris and everybody who was involved up to that point for sure with all of our hearts. <laughs> After he passed away, it was kind of a difficult time at Cerro Gordo. How would we go on from there. What would be done? There were a lot of meetings about it and one of the things that started to happen first was Cerro Gordo Stewardship was formed to take over the community development responsibilities for what community uh, development was still possible up at Cerro Gordo. And we also decided to then begin to pursue conservation easement strategies with Mackenzie River Trust. And through a long process, we had a lot of site meetings deciding to go through this Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Program process, which is a program that started from a settlement between the Bonneville Power Administration and the Grand Ronde, Warm Springs, and Solette's tribes to mitigate the damage that was done to habitat by the building of dams. So here's one of the site visits we had discussing the uh, various, all the great attributes of the property and how to conserve it and why to conserve it. And everybody was in favor of uh, making that happen. But that was an extremely complicated process because even though the uh, 1974 Cottage Grove Sentinel headline said, new village to be formed according to Hopi principles, Hopi principles did not include ownership structures with 100 to 150 people buying small parcel interests on lands. And having those people, well, a lot of them went away. Some of them died, some of them passed it on, some of them disappeared, and it was a Herculean effort by Jim Stevenson, Suzanne Hubner, Sanis, Don Norton, and others to find all of those people as part of forming Cerro Gordo Land Conservancy to pursue conservation on this 531 acres. It was a long, long process. It actually took us twice to get through the process before we could celebrate because the first time around we were approved for funding, but it was under the condition that it would be under one ownership and we had not successfully done that remarkable task of consolidation. But here we are celebrating the fact that, in fact, we succeeded in getting that conservation easement at last with Mackenzie River Trust and all of the other partners. So I can't tell you how lighthearted we felt after all that work in that picture. <laughs> And another celebration with Mackenzie River Trust and other people out there just uh, going, wow, we actually did this. This is fairly amazing. I just want to take you through a little bit of the features of the land from a human perspective as well as a land perspective. My scientific education um, is actually in science and in mathematics and quantum mechanics and other things in a college where I was taught that science is a very humanistic pursuit and that not only the hard science and the facts and the theories are very important, but that you cannot separate the scientist from the science, the humanity from the sciences, and that therefore an ecological consciousness and a social consciousness is a very strong part of science. So I see the Butte and I see all the land at Cerro Gordo from a very human perspective as well. The Butte obviously towers over Everywhere you look from this part of the land, it's a very precious place, whether you are along the land there at Rao Point from which that was taken at the base of the land, or looking at it from across the dam. A lot of the people that I talk to think that land is open because it was logged because of the way the history of this land is. People assume that anything that's open has been logged, but that is not the case. The grasslands up there, too rocky, too shallow to support trees, but a very, very beautiful place to be sure. There it is from up at Bake Stewart Park. It seems to be one of those uh, landscape monuments that is visible from everywhere, including walking out the street at Axon Fiddle and looking down the street from Main Street. Cerro Gordo is what you see. And yes, all roads lead to Cerro Gordo from my perspective. <laughs> 
in winter, it's a really special and magical place up there. We don't get that many snows anymore as the climate changes, especially, but uh, it is one of the more majestic landscapes around here from my perspective, and I never get tired of looking at it, seeing it, and climbing up there. This is the view up in the mountain meadow, looking at some of the oaks along the fringe prairie. You can see that uh, there's some scotch broom in there as well, and, and we've had work parties up there to eliminate some of the scotch broom, but we have a lot more work to do to maintain and restore that that mountain meadow territory. The view from up there is rather spectacular, and I always think when I, I look at it, I work with uh, DeWitt Jones from National Geographic on another project called Celebrate What's Right with the World, and he always talks about how important it is to have view keepers, that keeping the view of the beautiful places in the world is a very important task because it's through seeing them and experiencing them that we know why they are so important. So spend a lot of time keeping the view up on Cerro Gordo Butte. Just a couple of weeks ago in the fog breaking up there. It is quite the magical, beautiful place that we have. The meadows really are a very special and central place as well. As Robin detailed, most of the prairie in this valley is gone, over 99% of it, and there are not many places that have places like Central Meadow, which is something like 70 acres alone in that one meadow, pretty much untouched and looking over the valley from a number of perspectives. When I take people out on the land, that seems to be the place which is uh, the emotional and spiritual center of it. And if I need to know where I'm from, meaning nature, not just Cerro Gordo, Central Meadow is where I go and where I take people because there is something magical and contemplative about that meadow as well as special from another scientific perspective. You will begin to see if you look closely that there are invasive cedars moving in in there. Central Meadow has actually lost about 30% of its territory since the 70s when the project was, was purchased and we have done some cutting along the side to remove some of the larger cedars that have been encroaching. We will be having work parties probably beginning in June with Mackenzie River Trust to get some of those cedars out of there as part of maintaining, preserving, and restoring that meadow. You can actually see some old tracks in the meadow as well that are all the way back from homesteading days. The meadows are extremely fragile, so we have to make sure that we care for them. I always wondered why those tracks disappeared into the oaks in a random way, as far as I was concerned, until I realized that the tracks were so old that the oaks were not there when those tracks were originally made. A beautiful view in the winter of last year looking towards Cerro Gordo, towards the west. We don't get it under snow that much, but when we do, it's really special. And just a bit of a sunbow above Central Meadow last year. The other meadow between Central Meadow and the lake closer to the lake is named, for obvious reasons, Lakeside Meadow. Isn't that creative? And it is also a meadow that is a very special and central place. It's a little bit more invaded than Central Meadow is. We have invasions of blackberries, English hawthorn, dug fir, which has trouble establishing there, but nonetheless has done so to some degree. So we are looking at a lot more restoration that has some time limits on it before we lose it. Uh, so we have to identify the strategies between going in hand pulling, burning, reseeding, whatever it is we're going to do. We're just kind of at the end of developing the 10-year management plan for the next part of the restoration and conservation process. This is down at the base of Lakeside Meadow, looking up at the Butte, actually in a place we also call Memorial Meadow, which has memorials to a couple of the Cerro Gordo people that have passed over the past 40-some years. But uh, it's not an ugly place to sit in Lakeside Meadow and look out over there. So. The skies from Lakeside Meadow can be rather spectacular. Robin talked about the oaks too, and the oak, the oak woodlands as, as precious places in the valley, of which there are not that many left. Um, Michael taking a little look up one of the oaks up there. That's actually at the top of the property, way up in the Healthy Forest Reserve Program easement, in right around the edge of where the Doolittles placed one of their, their orchards up there. That's what he's looking up at. There are so many 
remarkable oaks. This is ringing Central Meadow. As you can see, there's fir growing in through the oaks. And one of the things that we need to do from a conservation perspective is to release oaks from the firs that grow out, that grow faster and shade them a little too much and too quickly. So we'll be going in by hand, removing firs that have been identified and will be identified. Don't want to take machines in there lest we disturb too much of the ground and encourage invasives. So you can see looking up that uh, the canopy has tangles of both kind, but there are some really remarkable oaks in Cerro Gordo that I just find to be absolutely majestic. As well as in their rarity, they've taught me a lot about patience and faith and standing still in the midst of things that are difficult. I find I learn a lot from those oaks and I spend a lot of time with them when I need to figure things out. This is one that had a bench under it for a while that was uh, called the Mighty Oak in the early Cerro Gordo days and uh, the bench grew a lot of poison oak so I do not recommend sitting there. <laughs> I love the oaks in the winter when all of those more than 100 species of lichen that the trivia talked about show their great colors. I think the, the oaks are just a remarkable thing in, in the winter. I'm speechless. The riparian areas also are obviously a, a key part of the land. Without water, we would not exist. And we do have seasonal creeks that showed up on Robin's maps that look like this when they're running this year. They are barely beginning to run at all. Normally, they would start around the middle of October when the rains came, but nothing came. And these first few rains in November have pretty much been soaked in. It's only now that they're really beginning to start to flow. But we have some issues with those streams. They're beautiful, but we have stream erosion issues to deal with as part of the conservation process as well. And we've been uh, trying to learn how to slow those flows down and how to place branches and do other things that will help restore those streams. Because without those streams, without water, we are nothing. That's just a couple of weeks ago as the streams began to trickle in just a little bit. Well, one of the things about this whole process is that uh, now that we have these easements, we have to start to develop a new relationship of community and conservation because we want to manage these lands for the benefit of the community, not just the Cerro Gordo community, but the wider community, the community in our region, the community that we all share. So we have a lot to figure out about how do we manage access? How is public access handled so that we share the land, so that we have the opportunities to provide environmental education, personal nature retreat, all the other possibilities that the land offers. So that is a, an ongoing process of how we, we will be developing, talking to the community, encouraging your input, asking for your participation. Here's Ed Alverson giving a native plant walk with uh, people from Mackenzie River Trust and beyond this past year. And also having a discussion up on Central Meadow with Chris Ellsbury of the uh, Willama Restoration Project. They do monarch habitat restoration and we've talked about working with them as well. They also have some trained land crews that could help us with meadow management and so on. So that was one of our uh, many, many discussions this past year. And here's an image from our uh, successful program teaching slugs to read. Uh, <laughs> the first worldwide success. That's the first thing that we can claim. So we figure if they know more about the habitat, they too will want to conserve it more. So. We know in the end that we are protecting Cerro Gordo, conserving it for future generations as well as those of us who are there now, those of us who are here now. So we are looking at it from that perspective of the great long term. And in the long term, although we have achieved these easements very successfully and now do have almost a thousand acres permanently protected from development, we will still need more participation, more funding, more involvement from the community in order to take the next steps, steps forward in that. So we'd really like to encourage your participation in that. We have uh, information on the table up front and we'll have a little bit up here for joining Cerro Gordo Land Conservancy for, you can talk to us about 
joining in work parties and beyond there. You can talk to Robin about Mackenzie River Trust and, of course, to Maggie and Riley and the others about Coast Fork Willamette Watershed Council as well. So we are so grateful to be standing at this point where that conservation has been achieved and that ending is only beginning. It's only a beginning. So thank you for being here and being a part of that beginning. If you have any questions, shout out. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yes. I'm interested in your uh, comment about the cedars growing in the meadow and the need to remove them. Uh, the, the idea that a meadow doesn't have trees in it because it has too shallow a water table, and then these cedars are coming in. What, what has changed and let them, let them grow there? And why are you not allowing the natural progression of what is a natural thing? The question is about the invasion of cedars and establishing in the meadows and why do we not let the natural progression happen in that regard. That I am actually not deep enough into the forest science myself to be able to answer that question properly. Oh wait, here comes Robin to uh, answer that question for you. So thank you for bailing me out, Ms. Meacher. <laughs> So I'll try to address the question a little bit. Um, so when we look at prairie landscapes, typically they are fire adapted systems. So really the mechanism that would have been going through there regularly would have been fire. And that would have kept cedars, fir, other conifers, as well as that thatch that I mentioned earlier down and out of the landscape and from continuing to push into those open areas. So at this point, what we've had to do is kind of try to emulate fire by either doing prescribed burns or by going in and doing hand removal of those woody species that can come in and really take over an entire prairie system. And it's an interesting dynamic because obviously cedar is a native species, fir, dug fir is a native species, so they're not necessarily undesirable. They're just undesirable in that area. And actually, prairies aren't necessarily supposed to be tree-free. Sometimes having some trees on that landscape are great for snag recruitment for those perches. So you do want some variation, but for the most part, if you allow those cedars and firs and other kind of woody um, plants to get in there, you'll completely take over that plant ecosystem, and you'll continue to see that loss of prairie landscapes throughout the Willamette in that capacity. Not entirely. Fire was both human caused and natural caused. Um, so as you know, we go through a cycle of fire suppression on our landscapes. So with the more humans that exist, the less you have fire on the landscape and it's been half, had to have been removed. But fire was used by native peoples for as long as it's been documented. So it's kind of that hard separation between the natural environment and the human environment when you're looking at prairie landscapes. Other questions for me or Eric, or for both? <laughs> you had uh, a lot of success in 44 years in developing the community and protecting the environment. My question is, what lessons have you learned that you might want to pass on to other people? What lessons have we learned or have I learned from 44 years of attempting to develop community and in conservation as well? Is that basically it? Primarily community. Well, I'm perhaps not, since I've come and gone in that community over those 44 years, my first summer there was 79, but I also lived away for a lot of that time. I was in college and too young to be really a large part of that community development, but I certainly see from my perspective that intentional community does not necessarily translate to successful community. That intentional community is maybe not a natural way to live, to be honest. Um, that's a personal viewpoint. That's not a Sarah Gorda viewpoint. I love living with a light foot environmentally. It's also extremely difficult. And that has been such a challenge. I mean, everybody up there would love to be car free. How do we achieve that? It's not that easy. Uh, Speaking of car free, I just got on a train to California, and one thing I witnessed on the way here, uh, north of Dunn, we are right near Mount Shasta, the juniper uh, woodlands there, they were doing prescribed burns. We 
Do you have a question or? Uh, yeah. There is certainly prescribed burning going around here. West Messenger and the Army Corps have done some around the upper part of Dorena Lake, and we've had some discussions about whether that will be part of the restoration of the meadows where we are too. That's not a, a question that has necessarily been uh, answered. We don't, you know, there's a possibility of that, but there's a lot, uh, a lot that goes into that as well. <laughs> yes, Maggie? the height of population in the community? Well, it depends how you measure the community. I mean, in terms of people actually living on the land, we have about 20 of us now, and that's probably about as much as it's ever been out of 2,500. But the impact on community and what community is becomes another question at that point, because hundreds of people came to Cottage Grove to try to be a part of Cerro Gordo. And I bet you, how many people in this room were either a part of Cerro Gordo or wanted to be over the years? I bet there's quite a number of people. And <laughs> there's actually, in one of the Cottage Grove history books, there's an excellent article about all the impacts on Cottage Grove that happened in terms of community, businesses being founded, people who came and stayed and changed the character of this town. And that is a part of the legacy of community at Cerro Gordo. It's really not necessarily a measure of Cerro Gordo as a community's success, how many people actually lived on the land. That Cerro Gordo community was and still is a great part of this community in a much wider way. Yes? Human nature is the greatest challenge in terms of uh, <laughs> making an intentional community work. Yeah, I mean, I just, honestly, I just don't think that our, our conscious minds are good enough at design and relationship to, to do it right. I could be wrong. I mean, I've, uh, there are successful intentional communities out there, um, but it's not an easy task to, to design and be. Any further, uh, any further questions? Well, thank you so much for uh, hosting us and celebrating Cerro Gordo. We have information out on the front and up here if you want to talk more about Cerro Gordo Land Conservancy and any of that. Really appreciate being here. <laughs>